Well, we've been in this series called 50 Days of Hope. And what we've been talking about is the 50 days between the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. After Jesus resurrected from the grave, he was on earth for 40 days, and then he ascended to heaven. And then he told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And they waited for 10 days. That makes up the 50 days uh, that I believe gave great hope to the world. And so today, what we want to talk about is that Jesus came to change you. He came to change everything, actually. And he came specifically to change you. Now, here's what we know. You can never have true permanent change until you change your thinking. There will never be lasting change in your behavior until your thinking changes. This is the power of the gospel. When we begin to repent and we've kind of abused and misused and misunderstood that word in our culture, when we think of the word repent, we think of a, a long-fingered preacher pointing his finger down at the congregation saying, turn or burn. And we think that is what repentance is. But actually, repentance is changing your thinking about God. It's not changing your behavior when you change your thinking toward God, you begin to agree with God, your behavior then can change. Why? Because God is the one that does the changing in you, and he changes your thinking, and as a result, you have the chance to have permanent change in your life. And so today, I want to talk to uh, everyone about how Jesus came to change you. Now, until you begin to truly believe the gospel... You'll never have true and permanent change. Now, the gospel in a nutshell, in, in essence, is that Jesus came to this world. God created a beautiful, good world, man's sin. As a result of the sin of mankind, God had to have a solution. The solution was never meant to be moralism, good behavior. That is impossible for that to work. That is not the solution. In fact, we know that it's not the solution in our heart because we know that we cannot be perfect. We know that intrinsically. No matter how hard you try, the Bible tells us that all have sinned. That includes you. That word all in the Greek, you know what it means? It means all. It means everybody. Uh, all have sinned. When it says in the book of Psalms, there is none righteous, no, not one. When it tells us in the book of Romans that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In other words, God has a standard, and that standard is perfection. And unless you can be perfect, and you can't, then you fall short. And his standard, you see, here's the thing about perfection. It's not a matter of whether there are good people in the world or not. Well, the Bible tells us that there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none good. Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that there are no human beings capable of doing good things? That's not what it means. Because we know that human beings, being made in the image of God, are capable of doing some good things. We all are. We are capable of helping our neighbor. Uh, you see this demonstrated during hurricanes and big disasters and things of that nature. There are people that don't even know Christ that are capable of giving, being good, being a moral person. But morality is not the answer. You see, the gospel shows us until we change our thinking toward God that he is the only one that is perfect and that he is the only one that has the solution for our sin. All religions of the world get it wrong. All religions of the world say, if you'll reach high enough, if you'll try hard enough, if you'll be good enough, maybe, just maybe, God might let you into heaven when you die. We don't know, but hopefully the good will outweigh the bad. And I've heard so many people say this. The good, when I die, the good's going to outweigh the bad, and God's going to let me into heaven. The only one problem with that, if that's what you believe and that's how you act, you're going to go to hell. And I'm not trying to be shocking, and I'm not trying to be rude, but the truth is, until my thinking is changed toward God, that's repentance, then I can never fully grasp or understand that in and of my own ability, I don't have the ability to be good enough. Can you be nice and moral? Yes. But moralism is not the answer, not according to the gospel. 
Jesus died a death that we should have died. Why? Because we're imperfect. Because we fall short of the standard. If the standard is perfection, the standard is not being nice, the standard is not being okay, the standard is not helping little old ladies across the street as a good Boy Scout. The standard is perfection. And perfection is blown the first time you blow it. And so the fact is, Jesus came to change the way we believe. He came to change the way we understand. God alone is the one who's perfect. God alone is the one who is able to do what no religion in the world can do. All religions say reach toward God, try harder, be better. But it's impossible. You can never reach high enough. In the silent, secret moments of your life, you know that I'm telling the truth and you've felt this as well as I have. You fall short. You're not perfect. But the good news is that the gospel is that Jesus entered into this world to die a death that we should have died. He conquered sin. He conquered death when he got up out of the grave from the resurrection. And God allowed the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the person from eternity past that had existed in all of eternity in perfect perfection with Father, Son, and Spirit, he reached down to us to save us. And that's the good news of the gospel. But see, until you believe that, you're not going to have the right kind of relationship with the Father. Until you're convinced that you're not good enough, but God is. Until you're convinced that you're not perfect, but Jesus is. Until you're convinced that you're not capable of doing it on your own, but Jesus did everything that was necessary for us to die, on, uh, for us to live because he died on the cross for us. Until you have your thinking changed, then you can do what most people in the world think to no avail. Most people in the world think that the way to being right with God is by being good, trying harder, turning over a new leaf, being moral. But Jesus, listen to me, did not come to make you moral. Now, I know that sounds shocking, and the, I'm not suggesting that God wants you to be immoral, okay? Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying, don't leave here and say, Pastor Richie said that God wants us to be immoral. That's not what I said. The reason Jesus came was not to make you be good, because you can't be good enough. The reason that Jesus came was to bring dead things to life again. And the Bible tells us that we are spiritually dead. Why? Because of one man. Blame it on Adam. In the Garden of Eden, you know what he did? He sinned. He fell short. He blew it. And the Bible tells us that because of his sin, that death has passed upon all mankind because all sin. But the good news is that Jesus conquered death and he died in our place and he conquered sin so that you and I could be forgiven and we could change the way that we think. Until you change your thinking, your behavior is never going to change. Let me just give you an illustration of this. When I was eight years old, I got saved and baptized. And I have no doubt in my mind as an eight-year-old boy, even though as an eight-year-old kid, I was not immoral, the, the extent of my sin. I was born positionally separated from God and I understood that. Uh, but the extent of my sin at that point probably involved eating food that my mom told me not to eat or tormenting my sister. That was about the extent of my sin. But I knew that I needed to be saved, and so I received Christ, and I got baptized. And it was beautiful, a uh, wonderful thing. But when I was 10 years old, something happened in my life that caused me great consternation and great problems. I watched a movie, it was a 70s movie, it was a Christian movie, and it was called The Burning Hell, The Burning Hell. How many have ever heard of a B movie? You know what I'm talking about, a B movie, they're terrible, 70s movies, you know what I'm talking about, awesome, because they're so terrible, uh, kind of like Sharknado, all right, that is a B movie, but in and of itself, it is a terrible, terrible premise, because we all know that sharks don't come up in tornadoes and come down in the middle of Los Angeles. And if you're, gonna, if you're gonna stop a tornado, you don't light a can of gas and throw it into the tornado and it explodes and it ends the tornado. That is against the laws of physics, okay? 
but it's still kind of awesome, right? You know what I'm talking about? It's still kind of awesome to watch. Now, that's a B movie. Now, The Burning Hell, the movie, the Christian movie that I saw, it was not a B movie. It was a D movie, if there is such a thing. I mean, it was terrible. The, the production value of it was terrible. It was bad. But here's the premise of the movie. There are two bikers, two motorcycle riders, and uh, they go to meet with this pastor, and they both had uh, wanted to talk about hell. And uh, they left all kind of upset. Well, on their way out, one of the motorcycle riders got in an accident and he died. And uh, they, the, the movie basically depicted scenes from hell, or at least what they thought hell would look like. And the other guy ended up going to church and getting saved. Okay, so that was the Christian movie from the 70s called The Burning Hell. And I watched this movie just as a 10-year-old boy, and it was... It was traumatic for me because even though the, the scenes were completely implausible, even though they were uh, very bad on their production values, it terrified me. And for about a period of a year and a half, maybe two years, I got into this routine that I did every night. And some of you have been here, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Maybe you didn't watch that movie, but for some other reason, you're here. Every night, I got saved just in case. I'm not kidding. That's actually the way I would pray. Lord, just in case, would you save me tonight? I literally remember, remember saying those words. And it got so bad that uh, I began to have nightmares. And I would wake up in the middle of the night. There were times I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd call out for my parents just to make sure they were still in the house. Terrified, terrified of what I'd seen. Finally, my mother, uh, she sat me down one night. I had this terrible dream and uh, had gotten saved again. I use the air quotes there. I gotten saved again before I went to bed that night, probably the 500th time I'd done that. And she said, Richie, do you believe the Bible? I said, yes. The Bible tells us you've got to have childlike faith if you're going to come to him. And so uh, anyway, I, I said, yes. And she said, well, the Bible tells us that Jesus promised never to leave you or forsake you. Do you believe that? I said, yes, I do. She said, so she said to me, she said, well, son, if you die and go to hell and Jesus promises never to leave you or forsake you, that means that he would have to go to hell with you. And if he's in hell with you, wherever Jesus is, it can't be hell. And for some reason, that made sense to me. And I really, truly believed. I'd already been saved. But that truth from the Bible began to change the way I think. Well, we're going to read some passages of Scripture today uh, that will show us some of the benefits of what Jesus does, some of the benefits of the resurrection, how Jesus came to change the way that we think, the way that we behave, and how he does it is probably a little different than what you might think. So we're going to read a, a couple passages from uh, Luke and then from the book of Acts. Now remember, uh, these 50 days are described in the last chapters of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and the last two chapters of John, and the first two chapters of the book of Acts. So uh, if you want to read about these 50 days, you'll read those chapters. And the passage we're going to read today, um, one of the passages, was after the resurrection of Jesus, and he had come uh, back to life, obviously, and he was appearing to people, and he appeared to two disciples, not two of the twelve. These are probably two of the 70 disciples that follow Jesus, um, and it's on the road to a little town called Emmaus. We're going to read that, and then we're going to read a passage from Acts right before Jesus ascended back to heaven. So let's read these two passages, and I want to show you what Jesus changes about us when we trust him. At, uh, Luke chapter 24, verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken... What is not, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Now, I want you to get this next sentence. This is very important. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets. In other words, he's talking about the Old Testament. The books of the law, the first five books of the Bible are the books of Moses, the prophets. Okay, so he's talking about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. So beginning with Moses, the, the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them. I want you to get that word. 
He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I want you to just circle that word. If you have a Bible that you mark in, I know many of you have phones or you're just looking at it on the screen. Uh, But remember the word interpreted. We're going to come back to that word. And then we're going to skip down to verse number 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He had appeared in a room where his disciples were. He suddenly appeared. And then I want you to notice this next sentence. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. He opened their minds. And then in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, this is Jesus right before he ascends back to heaven. He says to his disciples, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. They are not for you to know, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, I want to just give you three thoughts of how Jesus changes you when you believe the gospel, when you trust in him. The first thing he does is he changes how you think. Uh, Let me read that sentence again. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them. The word interpret there is important. He interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The word interpret means to translate from one language to another or to explain. Now, there are two very dynamic principles here that you need to get for your Christian life of what God does to change you, all right? The first thing he will do is he will interpret to you the scriptures. In other words, he will interpret like coming from one language to another. A number of years ago, I was preaching in Nicaragua in a pastor's conference there, and I don't speak Spanish fluently. I learned enough curse words when I was a teenager, but the people that I worked around taught me those. But uh, I know probably 100, 150, maybe 200 uh, Spanish words, but that's about it. I cannot converse. And so I had to preach through an interpreter. And I'll never forget, it was in this big arena, it was full of pastors. And I'm, I'm preaching, and I, I'm, I used an American idiom. Um, I, said, I, I said something about, that is Christianity in shoe leather. Christianity in shoe leather. Now, you know what I mean when I say that because it's like that means something that's in shoe leather means it's practical. You walk it out. It's not just something that you say, but it's something that you do. Uh, You back it up. It's not just uh, don't do what I, uh, don't do just what I say, but what I do, that kind of thing, right? Uh, It's that your words are more powerful or your actions are more powerful than your words. Everybody would get what I meant by Christianity in shoe leather. And here I was in front of these thousands of pastors, I guess it was, there's a lot of them, I know that, and uh, the interpreter stopped, and I'm in front of all these people, and I'm kind of waiting for him to interpret, and he turns and looks at me, he says, that makes no sense, and I'm like, a lot of people have said that about my preaching, what's new, all right, he said, no, that, I cannot interpret that, there's no way to interpret that, I don't know how to interpret what you're saying, you're going to have to say it in a different way. And so I backed up and said, you know, I had to think quickly on my feet. And basically I said, you know, what this means is you act it out. You live it out. Christianity and shoe leather is that you live it out. You act it out. And he said, oh, I can interpret that. And so he interpreted it. And we went on after our little conversation in front of lots of pastors. Now, one thing that Jesus does for you when you read the Bible is he will interpret it from one language to the next. Now, you say, what does that mean? Uh, I'm not talking about the Bible was written originally, the Old Testament in Hebrew, some Aramaic, mostly Hebrew, uh, and the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. So I'm not talking about translating it from Greek to English, but I'm talking about translating it from one world, the physical world, to the spiritual world. 
Let, let me tell you, let me read a verse that shows you what I'm talking about. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 14, the natural person, the natural man, it says in the old King James version. In other words, your, your inner person, uh, the natural part of you, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. And notice this, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. In other words, the sayings of God, the words of God are not understandable by a person that is not spiritual. And, and by not spiritual, we don't mean what is so common today among uh, particularly uh, women that say, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm very spiritual. And what I want to say is what that means is you're really stupid. All right, but I don't say that because that would be unkind. All right, so, uh, but they don't even know what they're saying. Uh, what they're saying is, I don't like church. I don't like anything to do with, uh, you know, having a relationship with God that would change my behavior or hold me accountable, but I love to be spiritual. That's what they're saying. Well, that's not how you get the Bible. In fact, the Bible says that the things of God are only spiritually discerned. They are only understood through the Spirit of God. So what does Jesus do? It says he began with the, the law of Moses, and he interpreted to them everything about himself. And what does that mean? It means that when you read the Bible as a believer, that you can understand the Bible. Now, you don't have to have a degree in seminary or from seminary to be able to understand the Bible. Now, it's important that a pastor and one that teaches the Word of God has that training. You don't need to know what homiletics means or what hermeneutics means or what exegesis means. I do. I need to know that because I'm going to be held responsible to teach the Word of God properly to you. But here's what I want you to understand. According to what Jesus did for his disciples was he began to interpret to them from the natural man to the spiritual man what the Word of God means. And so when you read the Bible as a believer and you ask God to help you to believe, then what the Bible is very clear about is that Jesus will help you to understand it. Now, once again, you don't have to have a degree in seminary. You don't have to know Greek or Hebrew to understand what the Bible means. And I'll just give you an example. The Bible tells us uh, in the book of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other as Christ has forgiven you. Now, let me ask you a question. Um, do you know what the, word be, or what the words be kind mean? Well, of course you do. Everybody understands what that is. But the difference here is there are two Greek words for the word word, and there's the word logos, which is the written word. It's the entire word of God. Jesus is the logos. Uh, it tells us in John chapter 1, uh, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Jesus is the logos of God. But there's also another word uh, for that word, and it's the word rhema. Rhema. Let me give you an example of the difference. If you read Ephesians 4 and you say, be kind one to another, you understand what that means is, and this is the literal interpretation, be kind. Not hard to understand, right? But a rhema word is that God, the Holy Spirit, speaks to you, that Jesus interprets to you the things that can only be understood spiritually speaking, that can only be understood in your spirit. Now, here's the difference between a logos word and a rhema word. You read that and God brings to your mind that person that you were unkind to at your work. God brings to your mind the last conversation you had with your mother-in-law. God brings to your mind the way you treated your spouse last evening before you went to bed. Do you see the difference? Okay. I can read, be kind. Oh yeah, everybody should be kind. We all should be more kind. But what Jesus did for his disciples is the same thing that he'll do for you. He will interpret to you the scripture. He will interpret to you the things about himself. So that word means to uh, take from one language to another, but it also means to clarify or to explain. So what Jesus wants us to understand is that he will explain to us when we trust him, when we believe he will explain the Bible. This is why you should read the Bible. 
You don't have to read an hour a day, but you should read it regularly. And even if you don't read well, thank God, uh, if you have the Bible app, which is one of the greatest inventions, in my opinion, since the printing press, um, if you have the Bible app and and a smartphone, you can download it and you can listen to it while you drive back and forth to work or to the grocery store, wherever you go. All right. So there's no excuse for us not to get the Bible and let God speak to us. He will interpret the scriptures to us. Here's the second thing. He will change what we see. And I love this, uh, this sentence, this verse. He says that he, then he opened their mind, their minds to understand the scriptures. You see, you and I cannot truly fully understand God's word and what he's saying to us until God opens our mind. And I'll just give you an example. There have been so many people that have come to this church that have gotten saved, that come from a background that um, would be different than what we would recommend. I'll just put it that way, okay? We have people that have come here that said they didn't even believe that there was a God. And they started coming here. And the more they came, the more God began to open their minds. And they ended up getting saved. Now, how did that happen? Was it because of my great rhetorical skills? Was it because I'm such a great debater? Was it because I'm able to just break down those walls in people's lives? No, that has nothing to do with it. What began to happen was, as they began to hear Scripture, you know what Jesus did for them? The same thing he'll do for you. He began to open their mind so that they could understand the Scriptures. And and I've got to tell you that the more you come and the more you ask and the more you trust and the more you believe in the gospel, the more you believe what Jesus is able to do, what he will do for you is he'll explain, he'll interpret the Scriptures to you but it also open your mind so that you can begin to understand. And so what Jesus does for us is he helps us see things differently. He'll help you to see the truth. Uh, Jesus said, and you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. I love Romans 12 too. Uh, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you. I love that. Transform you into a new person By changing the way you think. That's the way it works. He will change your mind. He will open your understanding. Then, once that happens, here's the the benefit. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You ever just need to know God's will? You ever wonder what God would want you to do? And it's not just about major things, about right and wrong, but also about the decisions you need to make. Do I need to sell my house by new one, God? Do I need to get rid of my car and get another one? Do I need to apply for this job? Do I need to major in this in college? Do I even need to go to college, God? What is your will? As you begin to seek the will of God, God says that when he begins to help you change what you see, to open your mind. Uh, He'll change the way you think, and then you'll begin to know God's will for you. And I love that. And so what God wants to do is he wants to change what you see. He'll help you to see people like he sees them. I've, I've learned in my life that when I begin to let God open my mind, my understanding is greatly broadened. And, I, and look, I, I watch news like you do. I try not to watch too much of it. It makes me angry. Um, I wish they would report good news. But I have some good news for you. You may not get it on the television, on the evening news, but you can come to God's house and get good news every Sunday. Every Sunday. Good news. Good news. Well, he'll help you see people like he sees them. I, I've learned that I've stopped being so unkind. You say, really? <laughs> yeah, uh, you, this is you being kind? Um, yeah, you should have known me before Christ. Okay, if, if Christ was in my life, I would be a terror when it comes uh, to being, you know, 
opinionated and, and all of this stuff. And my point is this. God will help you have compassion on those who don't believe. You know why? Because they're blinded by the God of this world, according to Scripture. Why would you be upset with people that can't see? You, you ever seen a person that was blind in real life and they walk with one of those uh, little canes, the sticks, they feel their way through? Anybody uh, ever said, I can't believe that blind person. What are they doing? Anybody in here try to trip them? No? You know why? Because you have compassion toward them. Why? Because you realize they're blind. When God begins to open your mind to understand Scripture, you'll start seeing people like Jesus sees them. And maybe, just maybe, you won't try to trip them because they're blind. And only God can change how they think. You see what I'm saying? He, he will change how you see Jesus in all the Bible, and he'll help you see through the lens of grace. And I love that. He'll open your mind so you can understand Scripture. Then here's the last thing. He will change your commitments. He'll change your commitments. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. Uh, we already read this. We're going to read it again. So when the apostles were with Jesus, and I want you to notice what they're asking him. They kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? That's a very interesting way of, of turning that phrase. You're going to restore our kingdom? And I want you to notice what Jesus did. It was a mild rebuke. He replied, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. What's the point? Jesus will change your commitments. You know what we are naturally committed to? Just like those disciples, even after they had spent 40 days with Jesus after his resurrection, they had spent three and a half years with him, following him around as his disciples. You would think they would have gotten it all. Well, you know what encourages me about this? If they didn't get it and they had that, I, maybe I, there's hope for me. <laughs> because there are a lot of times I don't get it. But you know what they were focused on? Our kingdom. It's time for you to set up our kingdom, isn't it, God? And Jesus said, no, but it sure is time for you to set up my kingdom. It sure is time for you to stop worrying about your kingdom and start worrying about mine. And so here's the question. Are you building God's kingdom or yours? Isn't that a great question? I mean, the fact is, it's very easy for us to simply focus on our kingdom, our agenda, our reputation, what we want, the selfish things in life. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that, that everything in life is selfish. God has put in you the need to have a job, the need for love, the need for food and shelter, and I get all that. There's nothing wrong with pursuing those things. But are you pursuing, pursuing your kingdom? your desires or you're pursuing God's you know what's interesting is that when they stopped pursuing their kingdom God used them like he had never used anyone else in the world because shortly after this you know what happened the Holy Spirit came and empowered them and on that day of Pentecost Peter one of those 12 apostles stood up and preached and 3,000 people got saved and baptized on that very day. In a matter of just a few years, the gospel spread literally to the known world. Have you ever thought about this? God used these 12 men, 11 of them there technically, and they added Matthias later, and then the apostle Paul came along. But God used these people, along with some of the other disciples that followed him, you know what he used them to do? He used them to bring the gospel to Asia, to Europe, to Africa, 
to North America. Did you know that? But you didn't know that, did you? That there are some apostles, according to tradition, that literally came all the way to North America to spread the gospel. South America and Australia. I don't think anybody lives in Antarctica, so I'm not sure they went there. But my point is this, in a time without the internet, without international air travel, God used them in their life. And by the way, all of them were martyred except for John, and I told you about that last week. They tried to boil him alive, and he would not die. He stood up in that pot of uh, that cauldron of burning oil and preached the gospel to a packed Roman Colosseum. And they were like, oh my goodness, I don't know what this is, but we got to get this guy out of here. And they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. Now, I'm not saying that it didn't affect him at all, because if you ever read the book of Revelation, all right, maybe he was a little bit affected. That's a joke. Gosh, y'all don't get some of the things that I say sometimes. Y'all are like, yeah, you're right. There's something wrong with him, right? <laughs> no. Just hard to understand sometimes. And so, so don't get me wrong. Are you building your kingdom or God's? That's the question. So when I began to believe in Jesus and I began to believe the gospel and build my life around this, he gives me this incredible hope that he's going to change the way I think. He's going to change the way I see. And he's going to change my commitments. You see, if you're going to build your kingdom, then you'll be selfish. But if you're going to build his, you'll be selfless. And if you want to find true joy and happiness and purpose and fulfillment and peace, then focus on his kingdom and not yours. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. And thank you for what he came to do for us. And thank you, Lord, that you said if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is past, the new has come. You have made us new. You haven't just come to help us turn over a new leaf. You came to bring us to life. And so, Father, I pray that you'd help us to do this today. For the believers in the room and the believers watching online, help us to be convinced that we need to trust in you and believe in you and that you'll interpret scripture to us and that you'll open our minds and you'll help us to see things differently and that we'll start to be concerned about your kingdom, not ours. For those that don't know Jesus yet, I pray that today will be the day that they trust you as their savior. God, I pray that you be with us and bless us now in Jesus' name. Before I finish my prayer, Online today, I want to ask you this question. What is God saying to you? In the room today, I want to ask you that same question. What is God saying to you today? Maybe God spoke to you about reading the Bible more. Maybe he spoke to you about asking Jesus to interpret scripture to you or maybe to open your mind or to change your behavior and your commitments to help you be more about his kingdom rather than your own. And if that is your prayer today, then I would challenge you to, during this time, to pray and to commit that to God. Maybe you need to join the church. We have that available, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Maybe you need to start getting involved. Maybe you need to begin to give. Maybe you need to make some other commitments in your life. But whatever those are, whatever God's spoken to you about, I encourage you to do it today. And then I wonder today, online and in the room, if you need to trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today. Now, just so to avoid confusion, because sometimes this is confusing, I wonder if there would be anyone in the room that would say, I have already trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I know I'm a Christian. I know I'm a follower of Jesus. Um, I've not just been a good person or a church member, but I know that Christ has changed me, has saved me. I'm not all that I should be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I know, however, that I've asked Christ to save me. Would you just raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it? Okay, if you've done that before, uh, do that, okay? All right, some of you did not raise your hand, and I'm assuming one of two things. Either you misunderstood my question, or you need to be saved. So I'm going to ask it again. If you didn't raise your hand just then, but you say, I'm already a believer. I'm already a follower of Christ. Already. I want you to raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand just then. Okay. 
All right, good. All right, so I know that I need to clarify this. Then let me ask the question this way. How many would say, Pastor, I am not sure that I'm a believer or a follower of Christ? Now, now listen closely. I'm not sure. If I died today, I'm not confident I would go to be with the Father, to be in heaven with Jesus. I'm not confident of that. I have doubts. Or, you know, I have never trusted Christ. All I've ever heard is that you're to be a good person. I've tried to be a moral good person, but you told me today that that's not enough. But I need Jesus as my Savior. I've not done this before, or I'm not sure. Okay, I'll be very clear about that. If that's you in the room today, would you raise your hand? High enough and long enough for me to say it. I'm not sure, or I'm not a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? Online, the same thing. If you're not sure, if you're not a follower of Christ, I want to lead you in a simple prayer. Now, to understand there are no magic in these words, but what happens is when you begin to believe and you ask God to give you the faith to trust Him, God promises that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, that you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I'm asking you right now to give me the faith to trust you, to believe in you, to believe in the gospel. And I'm asking you to save me right now. You may not even understand all what those words mean, but you want to be saved. Well, that is the case. Then uh, you online click at the bottom that you prayed to receive Christ. And then if you will, listen closely. Don't just do that. We want to be able to follow up with you. Now, we're not going to bug you, but we do want to connect you. We do want to rejoice with you. And so if you'd fill out the next step card and put on there that you prayed to receive Christ. The same is true in the room today. If you want to be saved or if you just prayed to be saved, I'm going to be standing on the blue carpet on the other side of that wall when we dismiss. And I want you to come by and say hi to me. Give me the card that you filled out or let me know and I'll help you, okay? But I'm going to be there and I hope you'll uh, do that as well. Heavenly Father, help us today to follow you. Thank you that Jesus, you came to change everything and help us to embrace that change by our believing in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.